Hey y'all, how y'all doing? Good, good, good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I'm um, getting ready to start a a master class, another one. As you know, last week we did uh, several days of a tithing master class, and boy, was it something. Uh, it was both a blessing and a curse <laughs> for people who enjoyed it and who didn't enjoy it, and it shook up some folks. Good. That's what we do here. Today we're starting another class, master class, on biblical forensics uh, with my brother, Elder Rodney Jones, the good doctor. Uh, today is the introduction to these classes, and so I'm hoping that you all will share this show with friends and family and, and Bible studiers, Sunday schoolers, pastors, or the presbyters, whoever you think need this, so that we can study the Word and find out there's an issue. The word forensic uh, is important, and we're going to try and uh, outline and unpack it and do a forensic study even on the word itself to try and figure out what happened. There was a crime that, that was committed in the church, all right, which has ca caused many to be biblically illiterate based off of this crime. Uh, and so we've got to now check um, the scriptures and find out uh, because the crime was committed against the word of God. So let's fi figure out how we can fix this uh, with my brother, Elder Jones, and hopefully you guys will be taking some notes or just hit the rewind button so that we can see how we can fix this mess. I'll be back in about 60. you thinking and where the topics are hot feel free to comment whether we agree or not cuz he's got something to say sir walter jones sir walter jones he's got something to say sir walter jones sir walter jones show Come on in. The water's fine. Yeah. Oh. Do hi. Hey everybody, so Walter, so Walter Jones show. I'm he. It is the evening. Nope. It is the midday connection. Baby. Come on in. The water's fine. Water's fine. See all you bunkers out of here doing a bit day. Thank y'all for coming in here in the middle of your day, trying to see if you can get off work early so that you can watch the show. <laughs> Appreciate you. All right, don't tell your boss what you're doing. Today, we're talking about forensics, biblical forensic master class uh, with Elder Jones. And I'm going to bring him on the screen here. Let's see if I can do this right here. There he is right there. Elder Jones, how you doing, my brother? I'm doing great for young old fellow. How about mm -hmm, yourself? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I got my AARP card in the mail today. I got three of them. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, for a few years they've been pushing it on me for a few, quite a few years. <laughs> And, well, that's uh, good. They knocked yeah. on my door and told me. They said, "You got to get this. You got to take this, Doc." You yeah, gotta... man. We've been waiting on you for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so I figured, all right, let me go ahead and accept it. And I get out into IHOP and uh, go oh, ahead and yeah, utilize. I, I was next door. I was at I Hope. You was at Hope. <laughs> I, I hope I can make it to IHOP. Yes, because sir. I was so old. <laughs> Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. <laughs> All right. Now, here are some shows here on uh, social media. I'm, I'm sorry, on your TV. These are the popular shows dealing with forensics, popular forensic shows. And many of these you know about CSI, everything, Las Vegas uh, and New York and Miami, whatever. Okay, Autopsy, Cold Case Files. Some of these I, I actually really enjoy. All right, uh, The Walking Dead is one of them. Uh, Corner, Bones, I enjoyed Bones. Okay, a lot of these are shows dealing with uh, forensics and uh, uh, if we go to 
Wikipedia, the other word is criminal criminalistics is the other word used for forensics is the application of science to criminal science to criminal and civil laws mainly on the criminal side all right so i want to bring this up because there is a crime <laughs> that has mm -hmm. been committed Ella jones can you help me out with the crime well, the crime that has been committed is somebody killed the lesson that the person was teaching. <laughs> and usually it was the teacher who messed that lesson completely up mm. and murdered it. They massacred it. They mm. killed it. They mm -hmm. choked it, choked it till it couldn't breathe no more. Mm. And when the students left the class, they were excited, but they left the class half dead as well because mm. the teacher not only killed the lesson, but the teacher killed the students too and tore the Bible up. <sighs> The teacher did this, <laughs> okay? Teacher. So the yes. teacher is serving as the murderer in this case. That's right. And we've got to find out what teacher did it. What teacher did this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how? What tools did they use to murder this lesson? So this teacher here, Jesus called this teacher a thief. Yes. Because usually when we try and quote that the, uh, Satan comes to kill, steal, yeah, and destroy. Yeah. yeah. Help he us out with thief. that whole concept. How? Yeah, Jesus, why is this a thief? Jesus talked about all that ever came before him were thieves and robbers. Wow. And there's a difference between a thief and a robber. Mm -hmm. And sometimes one takes uh, merchandise off of you. Yeah. And sometimes one would take a merchandise away from you, but mm -hmm. not necessarily from your personal body. Mm -hmm. And one you know that's there and the other one you don't. Mm -hmm. You've been robbed or whatever. And so what happened is he didn't say the devil. He didn't say Satan. Mm -hmm. He was talking about the church leaders mm -hmm. because the church leaders, these Pharisees, Sadducees refused to let the people hear truth. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus says, all that ever came before me mm -hmm. were thieves and robbers. And then he said, the thief come to do three things, to kill, to steal, and to what? Destroy destroy and the question is well what is he stealing he's stealing your opportunity to learn who christ is mm, mm. he's stealing your moment of yeah. getting a clear understanding of this lesson he stole it from you because he don't want you to know it and that thief is people who refuse to study their lesson and mm -hmm. what they do is they wait till sunday late sunday night and open up their lesson and start <laughs> seeing how fast you're a thief <laughs> and, <laughs> you are a thief and that thief, did he come through the front door or did he come through the back door? He came in the back. Mm -hmm. He came around the wall. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus says he is the door. Mm -hmm. Anybody that try to get in to the sheep any other way is a thief and they are a robber. So that thief is going to climb in the window. Well, then, bring a ladder with him. <laughs> right, that's true. Then what, what about the person who can't afford to go to theology school, divinity school, uh, at, go to seminary, okay? Uh, what, what's, oh, oh, it can't, it, 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 can we get that book at seminary? Uh, we, you can get this book at a dollar store. Oh. This book is so easy attainable, you can come to the church where I pass and ask me for one, and I'll give it to you. Wow. Just like that. But huh? what happens is, Thieves would rather steal it, but they don't want to steal this. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. Can't steal that, huh? So mm. I don't need a, a formal education. Yeah, no. don't need no. that. Take what you've been taught in grammar school, mm -hmm. which means to find the subject. Yeah, they taught us what the subject was, how to. You know, that YouTube is your friend. Go to the Sir mm -hmm. Walter Jones show. Go mm -hmm. to. Um, whatever my, my, what is your brother name that's sitting right next Blair to you Jones. talking to you? Oh, the one that's me? talking to you now. Oh, Sir Walter Jones. Oh, Ella Rodney Jones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go to his channel. Uh, go to, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> go to Bible class at church. <laughs> it's, and, and, and uh, what I'm encouraging to do is just simply take your time. Sir, one of our problems is we are a lazy generation, but we, we are a microwave generation. Yeah. We want it now. We want to be able to understand it now, right mm -hmm. now. And if I can't understand it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask somebody else or I'm going to go to a commentary. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. So it looks like to me that Jesus 
didn't go to all of these special schools because when no. he was in this talking to the leaders in there, uh, the the rulers and these special folks who knew the scriptures, he was asking a lot of questions, and they was like, he didn't go to any of our schools. Right. And they 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 even put him beside and above. Who are those people? Not the Pharisees, not the Sadducees, the scribes. Yeah, they did. He did. They said they he teaches better than the those who had the authority, which would be the scribes. Yeah. And they said this, this man can't. There's no way he could have learned all of this. Look at his knowledge mm -hmm. and his wisdom and knowledge of the Word of God mesmerized the people. There was mm -hmm. that awe, and that's how people began to believe on him. Not just because of his miracles, but because of the knowledge of the Word of God. And that should encourage others out there because a lot of times those who got these big degrees lord it over those who never spent the day in college. Exactly. In the business school. But as we were studying in uh, Peter and John's um, uh, Acts chapter 4, mm -hmm. we see Let's that start. they were talking to the the rulers and the very smart men who are very... Exactly. and but. Can you remember what these men said about Peter and John? They and, understood that these men were unlearned, unlearned men. men. Not only that, they understood and saw that these men taught with boldness, mm -hmm. verses 13. But then they recognized that they saw that Peter and John had been in the presence of Jesus. Oh, that says something. Mm-hmm. That says a lot. Yes. They were able to recognize that those men, though unlearned, were in the presence of Jesus. Hmm. Yes, sir. And so we're not speaking against seminary or theology school, divinity school, no. what have you. Absolutely no. not. We thank God for it because we I have some. I would love some, to go to one. Yeah. If I can, if I can afford it, I'd, I'd be in one right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not going to go there so that I can graduate and then prove to y'all that I went there. Right, right. And that's what a lot of men are doing, though. Mm -hmm. They they go there to graduate so they can prove to you that, that, that uh, I I now I I know the word I can prove it. I got a paper on the wall. Yeah. And these men in the scriptures didn't need that. I you know we learned under the late Doctor John Albert Jones. Mm -hmm. We learned under his father, the late Superintendent John Albert Jones yeah. of Jackson, Mississippi. These men were lovers of God. They were lovers of the word of God. And they were studious, if I can use that term. These men studied. They were diligent. Now, the Bible says, study to show yourself approved. Mm -hmm. The word study doesn't mean get in a book. The word study means to be diligent at what you do. Yeah. So one of our problems is we're not diligent. We don't have patience. And we're not willing to slow down and to learn what the word of God says. Yeah. So as a consequence, we're doing the big mistake. And I told someone the other day, never teach what you heard, only teach what you've read. Mm. Say it again. Never teach what you've heard, mm. only teach what you've read. Explain. Because a lot of times, for instance, uh, we've been teaching uh, that God doesn't hear sinners prayer. Right. And we'll take that passage of scripture and run with it. It wasn't until a few years back, a few years ago, when I read that passage of scripture, the word prayer was not in there. So I was teaching people that the Bible says that God does not hear sinners prayer. Even when I read it and the word prayer was not in there, I put that word in there sure did. because I was reading based on how what I was told yeah. and not what I read. Yeah. It wasn't until a few years later that when I read it, it said, for we know that God heareth not sinners. Mm -hmm. So number one, the blind man is the one who was talking. To number us. two, they were talk, ca calling Jesus a sinner. Yep. And number three, the word prayer was not in there. Yep. So never teach what you was told. Only teach what you read. What's the danger of doing that? Because the danger of you, you're misleading people. Because whatever you teach, they will learn. Mm -hmm. Whatever they learn, they will live. Whatever they learn and live from you is what they will teach. Mm -hmm. We'll have 20 generations of inaccurate mm -hmm. biblical teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Illiteracy, uh, generations of illiteracy 
being being yeah. raised by one person might have started it, and it's like a disease mm -hmm. that continues. We will have a we will have a thousand women standing on the outside of the church because she don't she don't have a dress. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, because the scripture says not to wear that which pertains to men. Yeah, and when we were coming up, we literally saw signs on the door that says when we were coming up. Them signs are still in the yeah, sanctuary. That, that's true. That's true. Yeah, I just put that on the, on Facebook. I just put that sign on Facebook. Yeah. Yep, yep, can't can't wear that. So the forensic thing here is uh, this video that I did see here. Let me see if I can find it right here. He's explaining. I'm not going to play all of it, just a couple minutes of it. He's explaining what forensics is, and we're going to tie this into the scriptures. Store accurate in real life. And the technology they use is just ridiculous. We are here to clear that up and talk about what forensics can actually do, which turns out to be pretty interesting all by itself. And to do that, we're going to solve a hypothetical crime. So here's our case. Someone finds a dead guy in an alley in Chicago. The cops secure the scene and the forensic investigators show up around 11 p.m. to gather clues. When they go through the victim's pockets, they find a receipt for a bottle of soda from a nearby convenience store timestamped at 5 p.m., six hours earlier. And, according to the ID in his wallet, his name is Bob. The medical examiners want to know how long Bob has been dead, which could be key to finding and catching his killer. So there are a few things they can check, and they all happen to end in the word mortis, which makes sense because that just means death in Latin. First, there's livor mortis, or how the blood pools. Now that Bob's heart isn't distributing his blood anymore, it just goes where gravity takes it, and that makes the skin look purplish from the outside. But if a body's been dead for more than 12 hours, the blood will have coagulated or dried. It stays in place, and if you shift the body, the blood won't pool in a new spot. Now Bob's blood seems to still be very liquid, so he's been dead less than 12 hours, though of course the examiners already knew that since he was alive and well in the convenience store only six hours ago. Next they check if rigor mortis, the stiffening of the muscles after death, has set in. And rigor mortis is proof that your muscles work in kind of the opposite way than you might expect. Since running and lifting weights and doing things that require muscles is hard, you might think making your muscles contract requires a lot of energy. But that's not true. Your body actually uses energy to make your muscles relax, not not contract. So after someone dies and their muscles stop getting chemical energy, their muscles can't uncontract, so their bodies stiffen. This effect starts about two hours after death. So help us out here, Ella Jones. Rigor Morris. Yes. Rigor Morris. A person dies and then uh, the blood coagulates, so these words have been used, okay, and uh, the blood, uh, then the, the muscles, instead of relaxing, it does the, the, the antithesis of it, and rigor mortis sets in, and then it's, this body just stiffens. It seems like we're seeing this type of stiffening in our church today yes. when something dies. Yes. We see the church of the chosen frozen. <laughs> Help us out, because there's a, there, the churches are becoming powerless. Powerless. But, and what has happened is, uh, I, I thank God for my Sunday school president, the Churches of God in Christ, Dr. Mark Ellis. He gave us to know that this is the year of the teacher and that this is the year of the classroom. Uh, and there's a dog right out there. This is the year of the teacher and this is the year of the classroom. We need to bring it back to the church. Instructions is very important. The purpose of a teacher is to instruct. The word teach means to literally instruct. Well, there's no instructions. People don't have a clue as to what to do. Mm -hmm. You don't know if you're eating the right food. You're wearing the right clothing. You're in the right location. You don't know if you're reading the scriptures properly or whatever the case may be. The problem is you've not been taught. And any church that does not have a teaching ministry is a church that dies. And yes. rigor more sets up and you can see it. You can see it in the membership. You can see it in the body of the church. Then people begin to be drained and they'd be like the woman that had this issue for so many amount of years. And then it's all about the money. And then people are broke. They're not glowing. They're not growing in any, nothing. And you can see rigor mortis setting up. I can show you many churches that, that you can see that rigor mortis has set in mm -hmm. because the church is dead yeah because the teaching is in error per the scripture we use a uh, passage of scripture for the wrong purpose yes it's like when you eat food poison is not made for your internal body mm -hmm. but what has happened is we've taken the word of god and we've poisoned it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we tell the people to drink it mm 
-hmm. And now the people are dead. So now we got what's called a routine. So I think he said something about the bones will do the opposite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So which means that the bones are still doing something, Mm -hmm. but not what it's supposed to do. Absolutely. Routine is you just doing this now, but this ain't mm-hmm. what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Your body just is on a, you know, it's like a mm-hmm. car that flips over. The mm-hmm. tires are still spinning, mm-hmm. but for nothing. That's good uh, because the body was made to to be mobile, to mobilize. Correct. And they said that the body at rest stays at rest. <laughs> okay. So and so when you if you're sitting down too long, people who are in uh, work in office uh, environments, they have to get up and walk around every now and then. Or, mm-hmm. or their bodies, um, if their bodies is fighting to be mobile, actually. And but then you you fight. But but when you when you keep telling the body, I'm sorry, you can't be mobile. Then the body just just does what it does, and then it starts to die. die. The body is slowly dying when we're not m- being mobile. All right. You ever laid in the bed for so long, you know, and you got up, and your body was just like, I, I can't. I just can't. I just can't. I think this uh, is what's what's happening with, with our teaching mm-hmm. in our churches is that mm-hmm. there's no life in it. And I think this is why God called Jews stiff neck. Stiff neck, yeah. They, they had rigor morris too. <laughs> <laughs> Their necks was stiff. <laughs> it was stiff neck. So let, wait, now let's, let's continue on this. Let's see how far he gets here. Hold on. <laughs> All right. And lasts until about 36 hours in when the muscles decompose enough that they can't hold their position anymore. In Bob's case, rigor mortis does seem to have set in. He's frozen in place, so the body's probably more than two hours old. They'd like to get a more accurate number, though. If the body is close to six hours old, that means he was probably murdered right after he left the store. So they take the body's temperature, rectally, a detail they don't normally show in crime dramas, and it's 29 degrees Celsius. Now, normally, a body loses heat at a rate of about 1.5 degrees Celsius per hour, a process known as alger mortis. When Bob was alive, his body temperature would have been 37 degrees, so it's lost 8 degrees so far. You'd think Bob's been dead for very close to 6 hours. And in a TV show, the Emmy would probably say that. But there's a problem. This is a cold winter evening in Chicago, and it's about 5 degrees outside. The body's going to lose heat a lot faster to the colder air, but it's hard to tell exactly how fast. Given all the information they've gathered, our Emmys put the time of death between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. So the body of Ella Jones is losing heat at an alarming rate. Mm-hmm. All right, that, that heat, keep, heat keeps us nice and warm. Okay, mm-hmm. that's why they t- put a hat on because a lot of that heat leaves the, the top, mm-hmm. all right, like a chimney. And you'd be mm-hmm. amazed how warm you get that just by putting a hat on. It just warms your whole body. Isn't that something? Yeah. I'm getting warm thinking about it. Thinking about it, <laughs> right. So how do we tie that to the, the, the um, what the scriptures talked about, grieving the Holy Spirit, which is a, a warming mechanism in us? Warming mechanism. It's a warming feeling. It, it brings okay. heat. Mm-hmm. Heat, heat is fire, fire, fire. Holy, he'll, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Mm-hmm. But what has happened because of our erroneous teaching, we put out the fire, mm-hmm. and so all the heat is gone. Yeah. So, so when the church has much of no heat, you know what I'm saying? When your body moves, it makes heat. Yes. A dead body does not make heat. Right. So when you find a church that has no heat. You find a church that is not moving, mm-hmm. and the purpose is it's not moving is because something killed it. It mm-hmm. died, mm-hmm. and like that says, uh, it didn't die on its own. Yeah. Now I'll, I'll I'll recap that. There's mm-hmm. only two ways for something to die: either natural cause or somebody killed it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in many cases, as it comes to Sunday school teaching and preaching, mm-hmm. it was murdered. It yes, didn't sir. die. On its own. That's good. That's good. Yeah. It was murder. You walked in church and you got killed. You, killed. <laughs> you took life because he said that his word is life. Yes, sir. You took a life situation, which was his word, mm-hmm. and you massacred. You mm-hmm. was worse than uh, 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 the, the, what was that massacre that took place many years ago on Valentine's oh, Day? Oh, yeah, Valentine's Day massacre, yeah. You put the word of God up and shot him in the back. Yeah. Yep, yeah. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna give you credit for that. <laughs> Let's continue. <laughs> yeah. There's no way to tell if Bob was murdered right after he left the store or two hours later. So wait, there's no way to tell when Bob was murdered. You know why? Come on, help us out. Because now you got what's called an eyewitness. Mm-hmm. 
So uh, before we get really into it, here's where interrogation comes in. Yes. See, first, you've got to gather all the facts that you can gather based on what you see right there. They examined that body from the top to the bottom as much as they could in the street, mm-hmm. right? He, even he said the thermometer, oh, that hurt just thinking about what he said. They put it. So from there, <laughs> right then from there, <laughs> yeah. from there, they're going to take that body to a coroner's office. The coroner yeah. is going to cut them open and determine a lot of things from the inside, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Then they're going to check the substance, the fluid, the food, and start going to those places where this food will come from. Yep. And they're going to start asking questions. Yes, then sir. they're going to have what's called a lineup. So they're gathering all the facts, which is the same thing forensic is in biblical study. you got to gather in all of the facts before you open up your mouth and try to teach that lesson. That's good stuff, man. That's good stuff. Lady T said homicide, not who suicide. That, yeah. Yeah, homicide is, is is happening in in our churches now. I, yeah, yeah, and then um, but once a, a a person do go into a Bible teaching church or stand before mm-hmm. a good teacher, and then they leave there and inst- and still reject everything, that's not a homicide. That's suicide. Yeah. That's suicide. You know the song said, "We fall down." In yeah. this case, you lay down. Yeah. Yes, sir. You jump down. And, yeah. and sir, one of our problems is because we're so used to the, not just the prophetic, but what is that? I call it the get rich uh, gospel. Prosperity. The gospel of uh, prosperity. We, yes, prosperity. Because we have allowed that to become our norm. Yeah. When someone stands flat foot and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ per the scripture, the person who's so gung ho and so used to the prosperity gospel or who's even looking for a prophetic word falls asleep because they don't want to hear truth. Yeah. Because everybody's not going to accept the truth. No, that's good. Yeah. That that's They're good. Yeah. The but the truth, this this gospel is going to offend. Yes. It's got right. to. Yeah, it's, it's it's, so if everybody in church hearing the gospel and everybody's loving it, mm-hmm. there might be something wrong. Mm-hmm. Okay, because Satan is not loving the gospel. <laughs> no. He's offended no. by it. He's and, and anybody who's in sin ought to be offended by it. Yeah. Yeah. So either the sinner is lying <laughs> mm-hmm. that they're enjoying the gospel or the gospel yeah. is not being preached. Or is, is he, they're giving him a dead gospel. Mm-hmm. They put some sugar on it. Yeah. 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 Because I, yeah, I never... Indeed. I never really seen a court case where everybody in the courthouse was loving the case. Right. Exactly. Because the defendant wish he wasn't there. <laughs> and and he's not liking what the prosecutor is saying about him at all. Right. He's not saying that's right, prosecutor. Amen. No, no he <laughs> man, I, I did that thing. <laughs> And, and on his way, when they lock him up, he ain't gonna say, Man, I sure enjoyed your case. <laughs> Thank you for this sentence. Thank you. <laughs> So when a when a, a person a sinner walks up to a preacher said man man i enjoyed that lesson mm. man that was some good preaching mm-hmm. something right something wrong because he should always be offended because the word should hit him or her or mm-hmm. even us who mm-hmm. are in error of the word yeah wherever we have a shortcoming it ought to hit us yes. in that area it ought to hit us that's good. Mm-hmm. Let's continue. Detectives head to the store and ask to review the security camera footage, hoping they'll be able to figure out if anyone was with Bob when he bought his drink. Turns out that as Bob left the store, the camera picked up someone quickly emerging behind a nearby tree to follow him down the street. But it was so far away that the stalker's face is all pixelated and blurry. You can hardly even tell it's a face, let alone whose it is. Now, if this were a TV show, usually the detectives would zoom in on the face and enhance the image somehow, and then run the magically clear photo through a facial recognition database. And then maybe the next part of the story is that they get a match, which leads them to another clue. But in real life, there's no way they could enhance a picture like that. When a camera captures a digital image, it's recorded as data that forms a map of the colors in each point or pixel in the picture. And those pixels cover bigger or smaller amounts of space depending on the resolution or how many pixels there are in that image. The color of each pixel is recorded as the average of all the colors within that space. But once the color is stored as the average, that's it. You can't enhance the resolution of a photo because there's no way to tell which amounts of which colors went into that average in each pixel. I like this because it, uh, I see dispensational teaching going awry. 
Mm-hmm. All right. I, we want to know where were you? The camera. We need to examine the camera to find out. And, and he talked about the pixelation. Where mm-hmm. where did we see him last? Mm-hmm. We can tell where a person is, a teacher is, a, a false teacher is by the way he's talking and teaching. We can tell where he he spends a lot of his time in the word. Correct. And t- a lot of time that's in a different dispensation than when we what yeah. we are now. Help me out with that. Yeah, you can tell antiquated teachers or yeah. people who were taught by when I call when I say antiquated, I mean the teachings of the old, but teachings that never should have reached the pulpit of our churches mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, because one misunderstanding. And so when you find a person, let's say this person is 35, 40 years old and they begin to teach strong about women wearing pants. They begin to teach strong about gambling or, or playing games, shooting mm-hmm. marbles. Mm-hmm. You understand the air, era that that person come up because you know at 30 and 40 years old, they're not going to get that kind of inaccuracy yes, sir. themselves. Yes. They heard this teaching passed down. Because a true scholar, when I say scholar, I mean student mm-hmm. of the scriptures, is not just going to take your word for it, but that individual is going to be like the Berenians. Yeah. They got to find out that, number one, what you said was true, and number two, they got to see it. I have yet, out of the sense I came to this church in 2014, I have yet to stand before the people of God without telling them to get your Bibles and go with me and mm-hmm. then give them an encouragement to read it for yourself. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Uh, Tony Collins says, I've, I've had ministers get upset because I wasn't affected by their hard teaching. I had already yep. been through what they were uh, sharing and gained victory for the next level. So mm-hmm. I wasn't given fake emotions. Yes. A fake, fake emotions because there, there can be some, they can do carbon readings and testings and they could be, uh, it, it could come back a fake positive. Fake positive. Okay, yeah. so some people were tested positive for COVID and they didn't have it. Didn't have it. And some people I were pe- tested negative for COVID, but they did have it. <laughs> did have it. Yeah. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So something happened. Some, something's something something's going happened. on, and it and it has a lot to do with our our testing mechanism more so. So some tests are more accurate than other tests. All right. Five of my greatest movies that I like to watch is CSI. Mm-hmm. NCI, uh, Cold Case, Colombo, Bones, and 48 Hours. Hey, yes. I went to Ohio High School. I yep. know I listed six. <laughs> In other words, they got 48 hours to reach this conclusion mm-hmm. because they understand after 48 hours, if yep. they don't reach the conclusion, it normally becomes a cold case. That's right. That's good. And, I, and, and sir, we need cold case readers. Yes. What I mean by cold case, last night, what we were studying last night Mm -hmm. was what I call a cold case situation Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because we took scripture that we have been uh, speaking about against or inaccurate for many years and we found some solutions. We began to look at the bones, look at the blood. We began to cut open the skeleton. In Mm -hmm. other words, we began to read what I call, because there's only two ways to study scripture subjectively or objectively that's right and the problem is we've been studying subjectively yeah. and we've been giving people what's called a happy meal yes but when you study objectively you give them a four course seven course meal with some uh what they call them staples you give them some cornbread yep. you give them some chicken some fried mm-hmm. chicken some canned yams and mm-hmm. you know and and, and 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 all of that kind of stuff so when you look subjectively, you give Mrs. Butterworth. But when you look objectively, you give him Allegra <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's continue. Like, let's say your camera has 8 megapixels, which is pretty typical for a smartphone. That means it takes a picture with 8 million pixels in it. That sounds like a lot, but let's just say you want to take a picture of something really small or really far away, like a person at the other end of a field. You can zoom in a lot, but you still probably won't be able to make out much detail. Whatever's written on the t-shirt, for example, might just look like a few blocky, dark green squares. And there's no way you can enhance those squares to see that the dark green pixels are just averaging together the bright green letters on a black background that spell out SciShow, which of course are available at dftba.com slash SciShow. If you wanted to be able to make out what's on the shirt, you need a lot more pixels that would each depict a smaller area of that mysterious... 
if you want to be able to make it out, you need a lot more. So herein lies um, the observation, interpretation, correlation, application, uh, hermeneutics, and all these words that we typically use. Mm -hmm. To just look in one text and one translation can be a problem. Help us yeah. out, Ellis, uh, understand. Yeah. What, what, what we're reading now, I read the Bible that Paul used to read. Paul used to read from the King James Version. And, and, and the, the problem is, every Bible we read is a translation. Yes. None of us can read the original. Come on, sir. Fact, we don't even know where the original is. We don't is. know where it is. You know what I'm saying? We have what we call the closest to the original. That's right. And then what happens is um, we don't know how to just use English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, like last night, if I can, can I read a passage Please do. that we were reading from? Please do. We were reading in the book of Acts, the fourth chapter, right? Mm -hmm. And when it got down to the 29th verse, because the question was, does the Bible support many feelings, especially according to Acts, the fourth chapter, because that's where we get it from, because of the apostles and disciples we saw were all filled. But we understood that they were already filled, so that must mean that they were refilled. And then we took somebody else's word, and we've been teaching that ever since. But when you get to verse 4 of Acts 4 and 29, it says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they, be, they may speak thy word. When you look at it forensically, number one, we see that somebody is praying. Number two, we see that that person is praying to the Lord. Number three, we see that somebody was threatened because he says, behold, they're threatening. Number four, this person is asking for permission. They wanted the Lord to grant his servants that something would be done, uh, uh, that, that they would speak with boldness, right? Yeah. But then what blew me, after the word boldness, you see the word they, T-H-E-Y, that changes the whole scenario. That now tells me that the person who's praying Mm -hmm. It's not praying about himself. Right. Because he says, uh, all boldness, they may speak. Mm -hmm. So now that tells me that when it said that they were filled, uh, it was not including the person who's praying because they were already filled. So now this, not, this does not mean that the person was refilled. True. You see what I'm saying? Yep. So forensically, I think that the, the, the thing that you just played, he talked about all of the things that they had to do right. to be able to determine something. And most of that was done while they were standing there at the body before yep. they left the scene. Yes, sir. Before they left the scene. That's good. Mm -hmm. There's some nurses here right now. And sometimes the doctor or the nurse have to take several vials of blood from you because yep. they... If they just take one tube of blood, there may not be enough to do the multiplicity of tests to find out what's what's ailing you. Baby, he, he's using them big <laughs> words again. <laughs> the multiplicity of tests. Uh, and so you've got to do these tests. And I think brother, gosh, where is he? I thought I saved his brother. Brother Aaron says all translations have a linguistic philosophy in its approach to the text. Mm -hmm. So depending on what era you have lived in, that translation is for the people of that time, of that yes. day, to help them. So 1611 King James was just right. A long time ago. <laughs> yep. For those people. All for right. them. For them. Right. And we don't really have 1611 because you can't really understand it. You've got Correct. to go to the 1700 version or 1800 version because... Though that old English, there's no way anybody in this comment section would understand it. No, we, we don't. We don't. And but now here's one of my problems, though, with the newer translations. Uh, what is that word? This was called translation and transliteration. Literation, yes. OK. Uh, in other words, when the writers, I think they some of the King James came from what's called the Bishop's Bible and mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. They had to take what the original or closest to the original said. And they had to find a translation for their day and time. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of times uh, every word could not be properly translated that's because there right. was no translation. 
Right. So when we get to these some of these newer Bible translations, when they mm -hmm. paraphrase, sometimes paraphrasing messes up. You lose the original translation. Yeah. And well, that's called mis mistranslation or that's called there. There are certain phrases and words that are lost in translation. Yes, sir. OK, they're lost in translation. So sometimes if that language that you're trying to put it in don't have a word or a phrase for it, Sometimes they have to make up a word or a phrase. And I learned that in uh, living in South Dakota with the Indians. The Indians mm -hmm. had just a, a they only they didn't have as many language uh, words and phrases as as as, as Americans did. As, as right. We who speak English. Correct. So they were trying to translate what the person was saying. Yeah, and I'm in the studio. They are in my studio. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the what well, the chiefs of this native uh, tribe was trying to translate the what do you call those the president's heads mount rushmore uh -huh. they were trying to translate the welcome and the history of mount rushmore in lakota mm -hmm. all right in my studio while they were listening to the the history they they kept stopping the tape the chief He's like, mm -hmm. we, I don't understand that. We don't have a word for that. Mm. We don't have a, we don't have a phrase for that. So the chief's assistant would say, make up one. <laughs> 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 make it up. I'm, I'm sitting there being blown away. And I said, God, I think I see now what's been going on with, with some of the translations. Yes. Make uh, it up. Yeah. Just make it up. Or, or or put something there that you think because because once you start a, a a translation you gotta finish it you gotta finish it. you gotta finish you it you gotta be all the way to the end oh yes and whether it's right some of your translations yeah. don't don't sound so good they just put it in there yeah some of them don't sound good but to the defense of some of those translations is uh -huh. King James had the We're same problem to we're comparing it to the King James, which is the only one we, we know. I understand that. Which now I'll which say they, this. They themselves had a translational issue. I'll say this. I don't and I was just typing and I I, I was replying to Evangelist, is it Titra? Yeah, teacher. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, teacher. yeah. Yeah. Uh, about the message Bible and I and I, I use my Donnie Swaggett tone, uh the message Bible is not a translation; it's an opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's ex that's exactly it. And and El Joe, as funny as that is, we have to understand when we're trying to do researches with the concordance and this and stuff like that, the the, the concise <laughs> and the opinion. <laughs> yeah, a lot of yeah. these are opinions and just phrases yeah. pulled out, and mm -hmm. we have to know. I don't throw them all out. I just know yeah. how to understand them. That's why, uh, for, that's why I, I, I went back uh, many years ago. I don't know if you remember, but when I used to study, I used to have three books. And I would study one hour a day after studying for eight mm -hmm. hours a day. Mm -hmm. I narrowed it down to one hour a day. And for one hour a day, I would be on my knees with my Bible, with my hymnal book, and with my Kojic, uh, the Black Manual. Yeah. And I would read, I would sing, I would pray and read a doctrine. And that's how I do it for an hour every single day on my knees. And then what it what it did was it caused me to not depend on other opinions, other people's uh, opinions, which we call them commentators. Yeah. So I learned then forensically is to I have this saying, read what's there, read only what's there, glean from what you read that was there. Number four, if you what if it was if you didn't read it, it ain't there. Or if it ain't there, you didn't read it. Or if you didn't read it, you can't teach it because mm -hmm. it's not there. Mm -hmm. So when that guy talks about this person who's dead, they can't add stuff in his body. Right. They got to look at what took place in his body mm -hmm. to cause him to be in that cir circumstance or situation. What That's we're true. doing is we are comparing the Bible to other things, but what we're doing is we're bringing the Bible down to us mm -hmm. rather than live up to what the scripture says. Now, that's good. That's good. Now, Brother Aaron 
uh, said something very important, and I agree with him here, at least the first part. <laughs> he says a word-for-word -word translation fails in communicative, mm -hmm. uh, communicating phrases, figures of speeches unique to the Hebraic culture, not to mention he Hebrew is a concrete language while English is abstract. The reason why he is correct here is because even with the interlinear Bible in which um, mm -hmm. we will be talking about on part two, uh, and bring out the strongs and, and, and all these other helps, is that when you're trying to read, use the interlinear Bible and go word for word, you can mess up, you can be mess up. because the Greeks or the Hebrew speakers don't talk like that. Right. So when you try to take word for word and what you're doing is you, you, you're losing the, the, the phraseologies and the originality, the originalities and things like that. And I learned that when um, uh, I, I, somebody wanted to take a song that I wrote and put it in Spanish, this, the, the singer wanted to put it in Spanish. I said, okay, that's a great idea. So she found someone who knew Spanish. She didn't find a Spanish speaker. Right, she found yeah. someone who knew Spanish, uh, all right, mm -hmm. who could speak a little Spanish, and she had that person to recreate my song in Spanish. I heard it. It sounds Spanish to me. Mm -hmm. My Spanish, uh, Cisco Garza, I think you remember him, plays the guitar. He, I was in his band. Yeah. He heard the song. He listened to it, and then he stopped the recording. He says, I don't understand this. Yeah. And he's a, he's a, a Mexican, okay? Yeah. He said, I, I don't really understand this. I said, but it's Spanish. He says, we don't talk like that. Yeah. He says, he says I can tell what you did. I bet you I know what you did. You took every yeah, word. Uh-huh. And but, yes. but, but we don't talk like that. It's like a Chinese person uh, talking in broken English. Yeah. We, you're trying to order some Chinese food. <laughs> it, it's just like Strong's or, or Dictionary, right? Yeah. We might see where he says... Because I am the light. Mm -hmm. So we will reference because I am the and light. Mm -hmm. But in the Greek, because I am the light might be one word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we take it as it is one word, we can properly translate. But when we take each individual word, that's when we mess up. Yes. So that's how we mess up with parables. Because yes. we try to take every word of the mm -hmm. parable and make it have a spiritual meaning. And sometimes that's not the reason. So I agree. What we do is we try to, and then what happens is there is a word, I forget how it, how the, the terminology of it, but it's when you take a, a, a word from the scripture, properly define it, mm -hmm. but take every definition and place it back in the scripture to see which one of those words properly mm -hmm, fit mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because we don't understand one word can have a various meaning, but it all depends on how the writer is using that word. That's what determines the meaning of that word. There, yep. Yeah, there you go. Uh, when using Strong's, uh, you also have to know that it uses uh, the lemma. Yeah. Of the, uh -huh. yeah. Of the word. yeah. 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 He, he also says grammar and syntax. Grammar. Yeah, syntax, the grammatical code, present be, participle. There you go. Between uh, languages, yeah, they that. differ. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is good. So we got some teachers here. Uh, Brother Aaron, he's 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 really good at this. Uh, that's why I like I to share his stuff. My name is good. Yeah, Brother Aaron's pretty good. You know, he yeah. he goes away for a while for for, yeah. for several months or years, and he'll come back well, and say, "Hey, I mean, he, hey, I was, after all, <laughs> Moses did the same thing." <laughs> Brother Aaron was somewhere fighting some war. He comes back. <laughs> He comes back all nice and well. <laughs> He's a military man. He's a great young man. Love him. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, let's see it. Now, I'm going to skip because he's going to start More talking about realize the, person who the DNA. Mm. DNA. And I may have to skip to that part. Hold on. Following our victim was actually back in the store about three hours later. They can tell because he was wearing the same clothes. The camera captures him as he puts something down on a shelf, then leaves water, the new hydrogenless form of phenolphthalein then turns pink. If there were no blood on the wrench, the reaction wouldn't happen because it wouldn't have a catalyst to help it along. But in this case, the swab from the wrench does turn pink, meaning that the stain is probably blood, so the investigators take the wrench for further testing. Back at the lab, they run a DNA analysis on the blood from the wrench and compare it with Bob's. If it's a match, they've probably found the murder weapon, 
and their murderer. Now this test actually works pretty much like it does on TV. DNA is the molecule that makes you who you are. Long strings of four different compounds or base pairs in a particular order. And everybody has their own unique set, except for identical twins. So, if you have a DNA sample, that's a really good way to identify someone. But forensic teams don't just sequence everyone's DNA. Instead, they usually use a technique known as STR analysis to match DNA samples. It's based on the idea that everyone's DNA has certain sections with repeating patterns of base pairs, but the number of times the pattern repeats itself varies from person to person. The STR looks at 13 of those repeating sections, and the odds of two people having the exact same base pairs in all 13 are about one in a billion. Meaning, they're... Yo, did you hear that? How mm -hmm. unique is that DNA, that deoxyribonucleic acid? And this is how we get the scriptures. All these men from who didn't know each other. Hold on, let me see. Probably only about six other people in the entire world who have the same STR profile as you. And forensic experts figure that's accurate enough. Plus, it takes less than an hour and a half to run. So, in our case, investigators find that the blood on the wrench did come from Bob. Yeah, that's how they discovered the blood on the wrench. Do mm -hmm. DNA analysis. That is so unique. It's like your, your fingernail. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, fingerprint. Yes. It's, it's unique to you like the DNA, and so how did we get this scripture from all the way from Genesis to Revelation? Over time, these men didn't meet each other. A lot of these men didn't, right. they didn't know each other. That's why, and, and number one, scripture never contradicts itself. Mm -hmm. Number two, the Bible said all scripture was given by inspiration. Breathe. Huh, breathe, yeah. Men of old wrote as they were inspired of the Holy Ghost. How many? It was all, uh, four, four, all, over 40 writers. That's right. And many of them never met each other, yet they wrote about the same thing and mm -hmm. never contradicted. Mm -hmm. One never contradicts it. Now, let's go back. And I love this DNA. The mm -hmm. DNA says this is who you are. Yeah. Right? So how do we use DNA in our biblical studies? That's a very good point. There's one thing called literature. And there's another thing called writers. Mm -hmm. The DNA is the literature that we're studying. Each literature has its own DNA. Right. You got your Proverbs. You got your Psalms. You got your Revelations. You got your law. You got your poetry. You got all of those. That's the DNA of the scriptures. And each DNA has its own thing. Well, what does that apply to me? Before you begin to teach this lesson, you need to look at the DNA. Look mm -hmm. at the structure that you're reading from. Are you reading from a proverb? Are you reading from a Jewish law? Are you reading from a song? Are right. you reading from a, 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 poet, a, a Hebrew parallelism mm -hmm. or Hebrew poetry? Mm -hmm. So you got to know the DNA of the Bible. Number two, you've got to know the writer. Mm -hmm. Now watch this. Each writer has his own DNA. Mm -hmm. Now watch this. You got two writers. You got Paul and you got James. They both have their own DNA, mm -hmm. their own fingerprint, but mm -hmm. they'll use the same word differently. Mm -hmm. Both of them talk about works. Yes. But they both use the word works differently. That's right. But it causes confusion among the people. Yeah. One says works is good. The other said works is bad. Yeah. So we say the uh, scriptures contradicts itself. No, you got to look at that DNA. Yeah. That's good. You got to know who the writer is, and up, uh, up, uh, that sounds like Paul. Yeah. By his writing, you could be able to close your eyes and say, "Ah, that's Paul's fingerprint." Yeah. Right there. That's how can we confuse with Hebrews? Yeah. They think that Hebrews is Paul's DNA. Yeah, they do. They the style. He ain't even got to say, "I, Paul." Yeah. It sounds you like never have to Paul say it. Literally. It sounds yeah. like him. You're guilty, Paul. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But that's the same way with the, uh, our, four, our founding fathers of the United States. Uh, these men, you can tell their writings. You can, exactly. tell, you can tell a Thomas Jefferson letter. You just can, you can tell. James Jefferson or Thomas Jefferson? <laughs> you know, Tom, oh, TJ. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. <laughs> TJ. All right. You can tell his letter. But then they sat down and they, they, they were the Congress of the time and they drew up the laws. They wrote, wrote up the, 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 the Constitution. Okay. Mm -hmm. A document in whom the courts are fighting over based off of what was the spirit behind the letter. Yes. When they said they, they talked about when they, they keep fighting over the Second Amendment, the, the, the right to bear arms. The fight is what did the founders mean about bearing yeah. arms? Yeah. Because they only had the, the muskets, whatever you call those things. Okay? They, they, they could not imagine 
this Machine type of in our AR fifteens that they couldn't imagine that. All right. So they're right. looking at okay, what did they even mean by that? And this is what we have to do in the word of God. Mm -hmm. How do we do a forensic test to try and discover the the spirit behind oh, the, the the letter that killeth? Here one of one of the worst things we can do, Doc, is when we're studying scripture is to interpret it in the lens of our culture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You've got to take scripture, 2,000, 3,000 year old lessons mm -hmm. and view it and look in the lens of their culture mm -hmm. so that you can understand why. I'm going to say this. There's a book called The Customs and Manners of the Jews, mm -hmm. Customs and Manners of the Hebrews, Customs and Manners of the Bible, Customs and Manners of the Bible Lands. Get that because it'll help you. Yep. It'll stop people from saying that Sarah tried to help God. Yeah. When she came in with the idea of, hey, let me get this guy going into my wife, uh, my, my handmaid. And I heard a woman teach this many years ago. Uh, Abraham been looking at Hagar all this time. So you got to watch your wife, your husband. He looking at your friend. Yeah. Well, had you had a customs and manner, you would have understood that that was the custom of the land. Exactly. That if the wife was barren, yep. she would take her handmaid yep. and her handmaid would become what's called a secondary wife. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Your husband would impregnate her. And when the time that the baby is due, they took the secondary wife and put her in the lap of the wife. That's right. And that secondary gave birth. That right. was a custom of the law. Mm -hmm. So I think that it is important for us as we're studying. That's how I witness yep. the customs and, and manners of the Jews or of the Bible is an eyewitness. So lastly, don't look and teach scripture according to our cultural view, mm -hmm. but focus on the view and the culture of the land in that time. That's that's brilliant and very important. It should be the foundation of all our teaching because we are um, we have been Americanized, we mm -hmm. are we are we've been Westernized, and a lot of European territories can't stand the West uh, because of our wastefulness, all right, and our even our mm -hmm. understanding and our lack of understanding of who they are over in Europe, especially in the Middle East. They think we, mm -hmm. uh, even though we're a superpower, they consider us being weak. That's why Russia is able to come over here and infiltrate our social media and all kind of stuff all right because mm -hmm. we're weak because we're walking and talking at under a western understanding and i think this is why biblical illiteracy is so vast in our churches because when we yeah. uh, look we open up the bible because mm -hmm. we don't understand the customs of that territory we right. try and push these the text in an american culture correct and it makes no sense like like marriage you know wedding that is a wedding really is about the groom it's, it's not about, it's, it's his wedding. It's his, not hers. <laughs> not hers. It's That's his. why he called the bridegroom. Yeah. The bridegroom coming. Yeah. He said the bride is coming. So in America, it's everything is showered. The woman, that that woman is showered. She's the one to march down with the long draping, you know, all that stuff. And the groom just walk in happenstance. He's just standing right there. <laughs> But, he got to see everything. Yeah, but it's not they about They won't even that. stand when he walk in. <laughs> they won't. They will not stand when he walk in. And that's the issue but that America have. But in the when I saw an Indian wedding, that man was the, he was the highlight of the day. And even when it comes to, to, to Jesus, when he kind of come back for his bride, it's about Jesus coming back on a white horse. All right. So if that's you see, why they rung the bell. Behold, the bride. Come on, coming, the bridegroom, because they didn't know when he was coming. Yep. That's why you got them ten virgins. Mm -hmm. They were not ready when he came. And when he came, not when she came. Not when she came. <laughs> very, very important. So when we don't understand that custom, we will, we will, we create customs of our own, and we move further and further away from yeah. from the original, the the or origins of the text. You said yep. yesterday, and I agree, the woman at the well, the Samaritan mm -hmm. woman, mm -hmm. once she heard what Jesus said, she went, mm -hmm. and the average person calls her an evangelist. Right. She's but not. Then, she's not an evangelist. Tell us she why. She did one thing. The Bible what? says she went and testified. 
That's it. That's all she did. She <laughs> wasn't an evangelist. No. She wasn't a gospel preacher. No. She ain't the first one that ran with the word. Nope. You know, Mary was carrying the word before nope. we, we we grab that, we gravitate to it, <laughs> and we go in the wrong direction. No. Matter of fact, the Bible said she went to the men. She sure did. <laughs> and she said, come see a man that told me all that. I, she said this. This is why it's important to hear what scripture said exactly. Mm -hmm. Because according to the Samaritans, that when the Messiah was going to come, he was going to tell them things. That's true. Notice what she said when she, she ran. Expecting. Come see a man yes. that told me all that I knew. Yep. That was purposely put there. Yeah. Because that was the belief. That's was her proof to them mm -hmm. that the Messiah is here. Absolutely. Yeah. And so an evangelist is someone who knows the gospel and know who he's speaking of. She yeah. still was trying to learn. <laughs> yeah. In a sense. The evangelist can't... deals with the good news. What was the good yeah. news? The good news is Christ won the battle. Yep. Absolutely. He won the battle. It, it, it puts you in the mind of the horseman. Uh, when a king goes into battle, when he wins, he usually sends a horseman back to the people right. and they ride on the horse. He won the battle. We won the battle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That person that brings that good news is called the evangelist. There you go. Y'all, it's one hour in. We're only going to do one hour each time. Thank you so much, Ella Jones, for coming. There's so much more we're going to do in part two. Hopefully his computers and stuff will be up. He can start showing us uh, some of uh, the, the things that we need done <laughs> in order to better your understanding of the scriptures okay i don't do me a favor will you pray for the people and their understanding father i thank you for this opportunity for this very hour holy spirit we thank you because you're an awesome wonder you're an awesome god we thank you this day for those that are viewing for those that will review father we pray as they study this channel as they study with us and as they study your word we pray that you would bring conviction and that you will allow us to read with an open mind not looking for something in particular other than what would you have us to find in your word. I pray for everybody that's hungry that you would feel them and that you will fulfill. I pray for everybody that's thirsting after your word and after righteousness that you would supply their every need. God, grant the heart's desire. Grant those that have open heart to want to know you. God, meet them right where they are, even if they're at the well, as you met that woman that was at the well through your son, Jesus Christ, and you open up her eyes. Open up our eyes, Father, and allow us to see your love and to understand your word. It is these blessings we ask in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Pull back into this young man. Thank you, O oh God, for his wisdom and his teaching. Pull back into his family. Pull back into his mindset so that he can continue in the track that you have sent him to do. Thank you for those who are receiving this word that it falls on good ground and they grow and prosper into their lives so they can share it with their posterity. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, sir. Let's come back. Midday connection. Uh, I don't know what you're doing tomorrow, uh, but let me know. Yeah, check with me around noonish. Yeah. All right. And see if we can do do it. I don't want to wait too long for part two because the people are hungry. Y'all spread the gospel, spread the news that the biblical forensic master class is on. Today was the crime scene. Tomorrow mm -hmm. we're gonna go go deeper into. We're gonna interrogate. Interrogation. That's good. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yes. All right. Got it. All right. If you're on YouTube, go ahead, share, hit the bell notification so you know that we are going live. Go over to Elder Rodney Jones Sunday School and hit his bell notification so you'll know that he's live as well when he teaches Sunday School. All right. We love you all. Thank you again. Talk to you soon. Thank you, Elder Jones. You're welcome. Bye bye. Peace. Fellas, does it seem like you can't get a good woman? Ladies, wonder why you can't keep a man? Then read The Four Women That Men Desire, Volume 1, by Sir Walter Jones to figure out how to break the cycle. Go to Amazon.com to get your copy today. Sir Walter Jones Show. Goodbye.